All right, we're live. It is Monday, July 19th at 9.28 Pacific time. It's a little bit earlier uh, than I usually jump on here, but it's kind of good everything gets started. Um, so a major update in Google Ads. It's in beta. It's not uh, available to everyone just yet, um, but something that I think is going to be extremely exciting, uh, something that I've been I didn't think that they were even going to do it. I didn't even think it was going to be possible. But uh, something that they did was they are rolling out enhanced conversions. Now, what enhanced conversions, let's move this here. What enhanced conversions are is Google is going to be able to tell you the information of the people that are making the conversions. This screen's a little too high still. There we go. They're going to be able to tell you who's making the conversion. So who bought, you know, one of your products or who filled out the lead form. Uh, it's it's not like a violation of privacy, obviously, because you're going to still have all the information. But uh, what is what's pretty insane about it is if Google is going to be able to tell you the, the person's name, the way that multi-channel attribution is going to be affected is going to be it's going to be extreme. Um, you know, it's not like, well, someone you know, may have seen this ad and then maybe I saw that ad from a different channel and then, and then converted and we think it's about the same person. It's actually going to be the person's information, um, which is insane. I love that. Um, so if a person comes in and fills out a form or, you know, converts on something to have that name, uh, email, phone number, whatever you can capture that form being pushed through back in through Google ads, <clears throat> that's, that's just huge. Um, I think that that's something that we, we have a couple accounts. I think there's like six or seven accounts that we have right now that, uh, are opted into that beta more are coming more are going to be along the way. Uh, but that's just going to be, that's amazing. Imagine we, one thing that we always push is to ask clients to do a, to have a CRM tool, especially for lead generation, because you can see like if a conversion happened, which is cool. Um, but sometimes you have tons of conversions happening all the time. And so, and you're running multiple channels. You might be running, you know, Facebook, Instagram, uh, you know, obviously Google, LinkedIn, Snapchat, whatever it may be. And Google's going to say, hey, this person's, you know, John Moran with this phone around this email is the one that bought that. Um, that is just going to be huge. I think that that, um, that attribution is going to be super, super, super useful. Because a lot of times what will happen too is like, let's say Shopify, for example, uh, you might show a conversion Google ads. And if you're looking at Google ads based on the click time, not the conversion time, your Shopify and your Google ads and your analytics may not match up all the time. Analytics misses some conversions. Shopify shows the date of the conversion. Google ads shows the date of the, the click, not the date of the purchase. And so this is just a really clear delineation saying, nope, these are the people who bought. So Google giving you the name and phone number and email or whatever it is that you're capturing in that form and telling you that person's name is uh, is huge. It's, it's a big, 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 big change. Uh, one that I'm really excited for. So I think that that's something that uh, is gonna be really, really cool. Um, I haven't seen any chats come in. I know there's some people here. If uh, if you can, just to make sure that the chat is working. Uh, if someone can drop in just like a hey or hi or some of that, just so I can make sure that this is working. Um, this is just gonna help me. Oh. Yvonne, hey. <laughs> Yvonne says this is at the TNC speaker. Yep. Thanks, Yvonne. Uh, so, yeah, I'm going to be. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for that. I just want to make sure that they're showing up. Sometimes they, they don't show up. And so that, that just means I'm just sitting here talking to myself for a while and everyone's asking questions. I'm like, all right, guys, see you later. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I'm. Uh, for those that don't know, I have a breakout at Traffic and Conversion uh, this, this year. It's in like a, I think, like, a uh, month and a half um, in San Diego, California. Uh, I'm going to be speaking about uh, e-commerce Google ads. So kind of what you all are are you know, used to me speaking about. Um, yeah, we're going to be uh, I was invited to be speaking at TNC this year, which is pretty crazy. It's going to be my first real like public speaking event. So um, I'm probably going to cry a little bit on stage. So <laughs> uh, if you're going to be in San Diego in, I think it's September. Um, I think it's September. Yeah, September. Uh, drop by in and say hi and watch someone make a, make a fool of themselves on stage. All right. Um, hey, Alvin. Uh, hello, John. If all the campaigns, smart shopping, supplemental campaign, only get three purchases in total after 30 days, 
would you stop all the campaigns, improve the offer, then start from scratch? Well, not necessarily. Um, you want to look at a specific trends. So if you are your first 30 days of all of your campaigns, a few things you want to look at. Depending upon your daily budget and how many products you have, you may need to give it a lot more time. I have seen this where people will have like a 30 or 40 dollar per day budget and then they have like 800 SKUs and 700 of those 80, 800 SKUs have not been tested yet by Google. So you want to analyze what's going on. If you have, you know, all of your SKUs have at least, you know, 20 to 40 to 60 clicks, you're spending enough daily budget to get the majority of your uh, products to have visibility and all of them have visibility. And, you know, your, your campaign is, is spending the daily budget and it's, you know, peaking out at, as uh, you know, at pretty much every day, then there might be some issues. Uh, your econ product is firing perfectly or, or your ID. Um, if everything looks good and it's still not working, um, what I would do is I would run a standard shopping campaign for at least a week and see what Google is interpreting your products as. And that could be, could be feed quality. What I mean by that is Google is going to take what they believe your product is and match it up to specific searches. Now, the bad part of smart shopping is you don't know what search terms are showing up for. So Google could be interpreting your products incorrectly, and you may not know that because smart shopping doesn't give you search terms. So by running standard shopping, pause smart shopping, run standard shopping, and see what Google is interpreting your products as. If those search terms are relevant, if they look like exactly what you would want them to see coming in, then you might have an issue with, with the offer, uh, or there might be competition that has you know, your same product or a very similar product for a lot less money, uh, or has been you know doing it for many, many years and it has a really well optimized campaign. There's a lot of a uh, lot of variables there. So what I would what I would say is that for thir first 30 days, you're probably still ramping up. Make sure you're spending enough per day to test the majority of your items. What's going to happen is if you have 100 SKUs and I mean, can you please drop in how many SKUs you have? This is going to help with, help me with the conversation. If you have 100 SKUs, let's say, for example, and you're spending $20 a day, it may be a couple months before everything's tested. And we know that very typical in smart shopping, 20% of the items sell 80% of the of the quantity of products. Uh, so like four SKUs. Okay. So are all four SKUs having had more than 100 clicks? Um, with those four SKUs, and it actually, I mean, could you drop in the, uh, the URL? If that's okay, I'll, I'll go and take a look real quick. Um, because with four SKUs and smart shopping, it, it should, it should optimize fairly quickly. Um, but something does kind of seem, seem off. Uh, so if you could drop in the, the URL, I'm going to circle back to you. Um, Michael, Hey, Michael, uh, this is what's up, John. Hey, uh, when using target CPA and pure broader DSA, do you even use negative keywords, uh, when splitting out? Okay. Uh, so first question. Yes. So I will use negative keywords, but I use them as exact match. And when I see something that is uh, frequent. So when you're using pure broad, the bad part about pure broad is usually you'll only have one impression, one click for a search term. And then you rarely see that ever again. By adding a negative keyword now, you're kind of like the police showing up after a crime's happened. Like it's not good. That same crime may not happen again if there's only one impression, one click. And then you add the negative keyword, you're not going to see any sort of effectiveness. You're not going to see a result from that because it's, that was just happened one time. So what I see is, do I have at least more than like more than 10 clicks or more than 100 impressions on one bad search term? I'll add that search term as a negative because that's something that's happening frequently. But if it's just one impression, one click, and then you add that one negative keyword, you, that may have not have happened yet again. So I usually add them for high frequency search terms that I know I don't want. So that's when I do add, I add them and I add them as neg uh, exact match negatives. Um, Yvonne, what do you think the new tracking standard will be once they ban third party cookies completely? It's interesting. Um, the, I still think first party data is going to rule them all. I have a difference. I have a different thought process in terms of what I think third party cookie ban is going to bring. I think that first party cookie, you know, they've been to my website and they did X or I, I think honestly, the, 
the third party cookie is going to affect more outbound campaigns. So I don't think Google is going to allow us to leverage the information gathered from any sort of third party cookie for us to use individually. Now, granted, we rarely use exterior or third party data in order to target. We use a lot of inbound. So if a person searching for X or if they watched a YouTube video because they were here uh, on a specific channel that we're, we're having a placement on. So I interpret it a little bit differently than I think the masses do, where I think that a lot of our first party cookie, did they come to my website? Did they do it? Uh, did they did they leave um, and remark to them? I still think that that's going to be a thing. Now, it can be wrong, but I do think that the, I think the first party cookie is what we use most often. And I think that's what's going to have the, greatest leverage and i think that that's sort of where google ads shines is bottom of the funnel your your advertisements are are structured to leverage inbound action so i don't know how much it's going to be affected but it's going to be interesting to see um michael, all right so michael says uh when splitting out one smart shopping campaign into two in the new campaign do you have to go through the whole 90 day learning process again with no row as goal if those products have not had many clicks or impressions or sales, yes, it's you kind of treat it like a brand new campaign, and which is why we don't usually split them out. We usually let the smart shopping campaign optimize when they're ready. And the first indicator that I'm not sure if those campaigns are going to be very effective is if they didn't earn any impressions and clicks in smart shopping um, when it was running together. I usually don't see it being broken out and just launching like crazy. There, there's a reason why those didn't have the inbound indicators that um, the first campaign saw. So I usually like to purposely start it with a lower budget without a ROAS goal and limit any sort of exposure that I have with possible um, ad spend uh, uh, waste, because if it didn't do good in the standard shopping campaign, or sorry, in the, in, the, in the first smart shopping campaign, and I didn't have a ROAS goal and it still didn't give me impressions and clicks, I'm not expecting great results after I break it out. So just know that you'd be cautious when you break it out to, that you don't overspend your budget. And that one new smart shopping campaign takes down the overall account row as because you're spending all of your revenue that you're making from your first smart shopping campaign and throwing it into the second one. So it happened again. All right. So it looked like I may have lost connection. And it looks like, um, can someone chat again? Well, Bohan chatted and it came in after it says successfully connected. Can someone chat again? I just want to see if the chat completely lost again. I don't know why YouTube does this. Um, I'm trying to help make you money, Google. <laughs> uh, and for whatever reason, Let's just see. I, I appreciate it, Yvonne. Oh, oh wait. Uh, Michael Johnson says, all good here. Okay, cool. Yvonne, I think we're good to go. Um, okay. I'll, I'll keep going. So, we're splitting out. Yeah. So, um, Michael says, or does Google learn about your product's feed at the account level? It, it does. It does. It learns at the account level if through smart, uh, through the merchant center. The problem is, is just if those had really, really good performance in the standard or in the, in the first smart shopping campaign, I keep saying standard. If it has really good performance in the first smart shopping campaign, it will continue to have good performance right off the bat. But if it's only if you're breaking out and testing it for the first time, it's just like having not an indicator that it was gonna be really profitable. So it may not be when you break it out. Um, let's see, uh, Bohan says conversion APIs like Facebook, Yvonne, question mark. Um, so that, I think that one's gonna be for you, Yvonne. Yvonne, we should do it live together. We should really do that, that'd be fun. Um, Let's see. Uh, okay, I'm going to read through these one. Cool, cool, cool. Vaughn and Bohan are talking together. Good, all connected. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I think it's either Jan or Jan. I forget. So sorry. Sometimes it sterilizes this. Uh, all right. So Jan says, uh, I believe it's Jan. So I'm going to call you Jan. If not, my apologies. <laughs> but for now, you're going to be Jan. 
Uh, hey, John, I have a problem with scaling smart shopping campaigns. I've tried 45 days with no ROAS and then giving it a ROAS goal, removing et cetera, as you suggest, but I sell less on no ROAS. Uh, yeah, what's your daily ad spend? Um, this is something too that I'm testing now. I'm getting a campaign that has about 100% return ad spend because I went from $50 a day up to $100 per day, but I'm gonna have to give it a long time. I think months in smart shopping, not days or weeks. So yeah, what is your your daily ad spend and how many SKUs do you have? And this is gonna help me. Um, Ali says, hi, I make, I make new account Google ads and make new campaigns. My problem is eligible. Oh, John, I'm guessing it says John. Hey, we have the same name. <laughs> um, oh, what I'm trying to say is I spend more and generate, or spend more, uh, what I'm trying to say is I spend more and generate less. Oh, um, right, so there's a few things. With smart shopping, without a ROAS goal, it's just gonna run wide open like a standard shopping campaign. You're kind of not leveraging yet your, your smart shopping capabilities. Again, make sure ecom product ID or ID is firing. That's number one thing I see always wrong with campaigns when it's not working properly is because when you spend less, it's just that one click to one sale. And you know that, that doesn't happen at scale. At scale means the remarketing kicks in. So if everything is good there. Uh, daily ad spend is a few hundred dollars depending on the day. It depends a lot on Facebook advertising. Most is sold as one SKU. We have 20 total. So here's what happens with Facebook and, and Google. If you're spending a good amount on Facebook and your Facebook traffic is mediocre, you know, so let's say somewhat good, your smart shopping campaign is going to heavily remarket those people that are coming from Facebook. I've seen this Facebook influences the Google ads campaigns a lot because it's heavy remarketing. So it seems like e-com product is firing fine because it is remarketing to Facebook traffic. But I have had companies come in on the Facebook side of our clients and kill our smart shopping campaigns because they send immense amount of mediocre top of funnel traffic to the website. And the smart shopping goes after those people. So you spend the money, but they just don't buy yet or they just don't buy at all. So outside influences can affect either good or bad, a smart shopping campaign, because it's going to remarket everywhere. So if you have Facebook traffic that may be eh, okay, just know that your smart shopping campaign may work like a remarketing engine for those people. So here's a good tip. Inside of smart shopping, in the settings, there's a uh, campaign setting that says it's going to go after new and repeat purchasers and is going to, it's gonna go after both of them. What I would say is a good test is have it be focused on new customer acquisition and give it a sort of realistic LTV value. So Google says, hey, if it's a new, or it's, if it's an existing customer, we're gonna put the value of $50. If it's a new customer, we're gonna put the value of $50 plus whatever you add into it. And so what you have to do is teach smart shopping to not necessarily heavily remarket Facebook traffic because depending upon how much Facebook sales you're getting, it kind of correlates to how many Google ads sales you're getting. And so your Google ad campaign is not necessarily a campaign that's running well on its own to new traffic. It's simply just remarketing because you might have your full daily budget only being spent on remarketing because it says, hey, there's, 275 new people that just came this morning and I have $200 a day and I'm usually running 80 cents clicks. I can only go after those people because those people have the most propensity to buy because they have been to your website before. So it's an indicator to Google saying, why don't you go after the new brand of traffic that just hit the website and not necessarily go after new traffic. Um, new customer acquisition is great out for me. Always has been. Is there something specific? Yeah. If, uh, if you spent more than $50,000 in the uh, campaign or in the account lifetime, you have to upload a customer list. Once you upload your customer list, then you can uh, you can click on the new customer acquisition. But Google said they're removing that fifty thousand dollar limit. I haven't seen it yet. Supposedly it's coming soon. So for campaigns that haven't spent that money, there might not be anything that you can do just yet. Um, and I think Bohan, I, I think what he said is the uh, 
it's not available yet because a lot of times Google won't allow you to focus on new customer acquisitions until you've uploaded a customer list, but then you can't upload the customer list until you have a fifty thousand dollars in spend. Now, Jan, dear John, your your campaign may already have that restriction removed. I have not seen an account with that restriction removed yet that Google said has happened already. So may have to wait a little bit. But with that customer list, yep, you you'll have to you have to upload that. Then it'll say, oh, we know that this person here is an existing customer. Let's not go after those people. Let's go after a new person. And what happens is when it starts to go after those new people and those people buy, if it, it teaches the algorithm, hey, these people that are coming to the site that look like this, this is who's valuable. When you're remarketing to existing Facebook traffic, it doesn't have that it doesn't have that indicator. There's no Google ads data. There's no Google data about those people. Those people are Facebook people. So um, if you can, try to upload that customer list and that should help steer you in the right direction. We've done this a few times um, and, and it's been successful, uh, but it's not every time. It's just a step in the right direction because you're running Facebook and you might be spending your full daily budget on Facebook. I don't know how much money you're spending on, Google, on, on Facebook ads, but if your Facebook traffic is high, just know your smart shopping might just go after only those people. So if you have mediocre traffic coming from there, that could be the issue. Let's see if there's any, uh, um, the other one's perfect. I don't think I see any other chats yet, but let me go through and look to see what, uh, okay, that looks good. Do you use Zapier to upload customer match lists or you just upload it once? Uh, no, you just upload it right into Google ads. Um, it's right in the audience manager in the remarketing under customer lists. So that's, I would say, just right into audience manager on the left-hand side, click on the plus symbol under remarketing, and I'll say, what list are you, or where do you want to remarket? Click customer list, and it'll give you a um, example spreadsheet that you can actually just take one of those examples, fill in your data, and then re-upload it through the upload section, um, and it'll, it'll be perfect. Um, all right. Can you clarify why Google doesn't need to learn at the keyword level for a pure broad TCPA campaign? Uh, well, Google will learn at the keyword level, um, but what it does is it takes what they call latent semantic indexing. It's the same engine that Google Search Console uses in order to rank you for a specific um, keyword. So with TCPA Pure Broad in search specifically, the reason why it's viable again and why Pure Broad used to be horrible and now Pure Broad is a little bit is is definitely more viable now. It's not the be all end all, but it's a really great place to start. Is Google will read your website traffic or read your websites, it's similar to how the Google Search Engine will. So let me let me back up here. Or Google Search Console, the way that it ranks you organically for SEO, is this is okay. We have this traffic here. This traffic are people going to Google and searching things. Let's read your website and say, hmm. I interpret that your website content should match up to this search here because we know that when people search this and then they go to your, they go to a website, when the click through rate is high and the page engagement is high, like time on site page per session, that means that we correlated that this English word here matches this English word here. And that's a keyword that you're going after that's also found on your site. What it uses is something called latent semantic indexing, which means that all that Google, all it means is Google learned English and it knows synonyms. So for example, office supplies means printer paper. They know that those two are synonymous with each other. Office supplies also means staples. Could mean office supplies could also mean a desk. It, it could mean a chair, uh, like an office chair. It could be a mouse pad. And so Google knows that office supplies means X. They found office supplies on your website. You're going after mouse pads. And so it says, well, if you have office supplies and mouse pads, we're going to give all the similarities between everything that we've ever found for those two and provide search terms for it. Now, what happens is you get a lot of search terms that are not necessarily, um, um, not necessarily exactly what you want, but is around the topical category of what you want. And so when you see uh, pure broad working like that, think of it just like there's it's SEO with a focus keyword. That's how that's how pure broad works is if your website content is clean and your keywords are about this very similar to what you have on your website content, Google will say, OK, this is the keyword you want on this topic. I see that on this page here as well. So based on what you have on your website, what you want to go after, I'm going to filter the traffic between 
what everybody that should come to your website looks like, but filter out only the keyword topic that you wanted and give it to you. So the S, it's almost like a big SEO filter. And that's how Pure Broad works, is it reads your website and then says, okay, I have 100 keywords. And then you say, yeah, but I'm going after these five. It says, okay, well, these 100 keywords I've turned on to 20. And now these 20 are what is going to be what is going to be given to you. Uh, it seems like it could get really expensive if, if each Pure Broad keyword has to go through a testing phase with a high, yeah. Oh yeah, it's definitely expensive. Um, if when companies hire us, I say the first 90 days, don't expect like the best performance. Um, you have to obviously go through, and then you don't necessarily start with a crazy high target CPA. If you start with a high CPA and you're getting that traffic, then bring it down. Just don't start with a $5 cost per acquisition on a $6 per click keyword. It's just never gonna run. So you have to start at high to allow it to run and then bring it down after you start to see conversions coming. Or even if you have a high amount of traffic, then bring it down. I just I just say start high. Don't start high, keep it high forever because that's just gonna be really expensive. But start it high just so that it can get the campaign to run. And you'll find that once you start to reduce that, and you can start to reduce that TCPA goal in the first five days. You can you can start to bring that down. It just means I just mean that a lot of people will start it and they'll put the perfect cost per acquisition that they want on there, like seven dollars. And then they wonder why the campaign doesn't run. So for my, for me being educational to everyone, I can't say, hey, go ahead and put the target cost per acquisition that you want there and turn it on. And then everyone comes back to me and says, well, it didn't run. So start it higher and then get it to run and then bring it down. So don't just, it's like a, don't keep it high and don't keep it low. Start high and bring it down rapidly because then you're going to see that the, your, your, your daily spend is going to reduce a little bit. That's fine, but you're not going to overspend for it. <clears throat> if you have a product that is, you know, 10, 20, 30 dollars, it may not work ever. I have one campaign that I've been running for a year and it's struggling to get profitable because the average price per product is nine dollars and ninety nine cents. If I'm paying two dollars a click, I'm pretty much, you know, I'm dead in the water if unless I have 50 percent conversion rates. So just know that there might be some items that uh, are on your website or mass majority of what people buy that TCPA just may not ever work. So for those that have, you know, very inexpensive items, just think logically, you might not be able to pay X amount of cost per click because two clicks, then your whole product profit margin is gone. Then you might have to scrap the whole campaign <clears throat> where this works better is usually, you know, 50 or like 60 to anything higher average card value. Then you could pay 10, 20, $30 per, per conversion because of average out maybe at $20 and you have $300, $300 or 300 row as campaign. Um, let's see, uh, see impressions in a day. If your proof status eligible, yes. Uh, I see impressions, but only two, only two impressions in two days. If you're running smart shopping, what's going to happen is the first two days are kind of sometimes actually first three days. I've had it up to about five days. One time, extreme case, I had a seven day one time that, uh, if you start a smart shopping campaign, um, so can okay, give me an answer. I make new account, new campaign. How much time do you need to show results? Uh, at least a week, depending on your goals. Now you can abs you can have accidentally mess yourself up though, Ali. So if you are running a smart shopping campaign and you start with a t target CPA goal, which means your target row as if you if you enable that, you're gonna maybe only see two impressions in two days and may only see ten impressions after a month. When you start with a target CPA goal, you tell the campaign don't spend a dime unless you can get this result. It says, well, I don't even know if I can get the result, so I'm not gonna run. If you start a search campaign. And you start with a target CPA that's too low, it will not run. If you have a smart shopping campaign, even without a ROAS goal and no e-com prior to your ID firing, it may not run at a high level. It might just only give you small results over time. Uh, so if you're only seeing, uh, Ali, what's your bidding strategies? Ali, please let me know what your bidding strategies are. So what bidding strategy and what did you set as a, as a goal? So if you're using target CPA, what is your CPA goal? If you're using target ROAS, what's your target ROAS goal? If you're using, you know, enhanced CPC and what's your mat, what's your bids? So let me know, kind of give me some more information. I can help you out here. Um, uh, I put $10. Is that your target CPA? And if you have a $10, uh, that's what I need to, to, to do, uh, to know, Ali, if you put $10, is that your target CPA? Um, perfect. Let's move on. Uh, what customer type 
when they ready to buy the product, like transactional keywords? Oh, yes, for app install. You need to bump up that CPA goal then. And this is kind of going back to, you know, you may want, you know, cost per acquisitions of $10 for your app, app installs. However, Google is going to say, well, can I get to that level? If it says, I don't know yet, it will not run. So increase that target CPA goal just to get it to start, then bring it back down. Target CPA, when starting out, is the best long-term, but the hardest short-term. More data that you have, every new conversion that comes in gives that bidding algorithm more concrete foundation in order to adjust. So if you put $10 and it won't run, either choose a different bidding strategy, like start off maybe with maximize clicks first, just to get some activity in there, maximize conversions, a little bit more expensive, but activity in there, and then switch over to target CPA. If target CPA will not start, if, if the campaign will not start, if you set the target CPA from 10 to like 30, just because you're saying you're, you're, it's a restricted bidding strategy. Don't start unless you can give me $10 CPA. I don't know if I can, so I'm not going to start. That's what Google's saying. Um, so, uh, Diraj, I'm so sorry if I, if I butchered the keyword. So what customer type when they ready to buy the product, like transactional keywords? So I think, uh, if you're asking like, what do people type when they're ready to buy? No one knows the answer to that until you find it out. And so what you have to do is make 30 different keywords that you think are, are people are going to be using when they have a purchase intent. So things like best or top or most reviewed or most popular local, um, you know, even things like buy purchase online. Um, those things are all buying or high intent keywords, you know, shoe cool, but best running shoe much better. So think about the keywords that someone is going to look for when they're ready to buy. No one can tell you that. Um, you have to find those out and you have to test those first. So hopefully that helps. Um, I mean, I also run Facebook ads besides smart shopping. If you want to clean the data for my, if I want to clean the data for my smart shopping campaign, should I stop the current smart shopping, stop Facebook ads, run search first, then create a new smart shopping campaign. So if you really want to, you know, clean the data, what I would, it's, it's almost impossible to kind of, to kind of just separate those two. And that's the bad part about it. What I would say is run a standard shopping campaign first. Now, um, run a standard shopping campaign and everything else, just because your standard shopping campaign is going to help deliver more Google conversions. Um, if you started your smart shopping campaign and that's the first campaign that you've ran and you've been running Facebook, it's just going to be a big remarketing campaign. Run standard shopping first. Um, run standard shopping first because you'll A, teach Google that these are people going to Google and taking these actions, not just who's been to your website. You also get a chance to see how is your feed being interpreted by Google? Does Google give you search terms in your standard shopping campaigns that are relevant to your products? If they are, then keep going. I would run and maybe even just run maximize conversions. You know, get a little bit aggressive in your smart, in your standard shopping campaign and let Google see people that come from Google and what they do. And that'll focus less on your, your, your Facebook traffic when you start a smart shopping campaign. Run standard shopping for 20 conversions, then start smart shopping. And let me know how that goes. Uh, Michael, sorry to be a dead horse. <laughs> Just to be clear, no worries. If I'm adding a new pure broad keyword, so you're adding new pure broad keyword. Should you temporarily set the TCPA for the new keyword high to start getting results, then lower it quickly? Well, yes. So that's, and I'm imagining you're, you're adjusting. I'm kind of confused because target CPA is, is cam campaign wide. So if you're testing a new broad keyword, are you saying that, um, if you have your campaign, let's say five keywords, and you put a six one in there, should you should you start your, your increase your target CPA? My opinion would be, uh, oh, okay, at the ad group, got it. Um, so if you if you do, you have to take into consideration what the campaign is already performing as. So what I mean by that is if you have four ad groups that are just rocking and rolling and you stick a fifth 
ad group in there with a target CPA that's possibly you know higher, it may say, well, am I going to get a better result with that new ad group than what I'm currently getting? Sometimes no. So what ends up happening is I would stick that keyword in now at a slightly higher than perfect TCPA and just start testing there. If it starts getting impressions and click, give it some time. If not, then yes, raise that up a little bit. Once you start getting impressions and clicks, then back and back down a little bit. It's best off if you wait for a few conversions to come in. All you're thinking about is Google says, do I know what the A is going to be in target CPA? Target CPA with zero conversions doesn't work very well. You have to allow those things to come in. So target CPA, I would, I would raise it up high, allow the impressions and clicks. I would wait for at least a few conversions before dropping it down. Don't set it too high that it just blows out your daily budget. You know, set it reasonably high. So if you have your average CPA of being $20, set it to like 35. Don't set it to 100 yet. Just set it to like 35, let's say, and allow for some, for some traffic to come in. You're throttling that campaign with your target CPA goal in the ad group level. So hopefully that helps. Um, Josh says, which cost per click I can start on the campaign when the keyword planner says minimum one and maximum five, like which is the perfect cost per click to start? So if you're, yep, Michael, good job, man. Uh, so in terms of Google Keyword Planner, Google Keyword Planner, I've seen in the results based on the, um, based on what Keyword Planner has told me to be about no joke, 25 to 30% accurate. Because if you're using Keyword Planner, hopefully you're using the same targeting settings, like country or, or state, that you would if, if a campaign actually, or region or whatever maybe that your campaign's actually running in. Once, once location changes, all those results go out the window. So make sure that you're setting up Keyword Planner to be exactly what your campaign would run. And then I would use, if you wanna be placement-minded, use manual CPC, the eCPC enabled, and then if you are saying $1 is top of page, $5, so $1 is top of page low range, $5 is top of page high range. What that means is in the first four spots of Google, it'd be one, two, four, five. You know, that's just as an example. I find that position two and three are much better than position one when starting out. Because too low on the page means that you're the last considered, which means they buy everywhere else. The first one means you're the first considered, but you're also paying three times what you would need for that traffic. So number two and three position is where I usually find the best because I'm high enough on the page to be one of the first considered, but I'm not, but I can get enough traffic to not blow up my daily budget on two clicks. So I would say that start with $3 and just see what your top search impression share rank is an absolute top impression share rank is and compare to the average top impression share rank due to either lost or budget. And then the absolute top impression, or impression share due to uh, lost due to either rank or budget, and then adjust those bids accordingly. Average position is now gone inside of Google, so you have to use impression share, top impression share, absolute top impression share, which means first page, top page, number one. Find out what those percentiles are per keyword, and then once you start to get those results in, you have to make adjustments by each one of those keywords in order to make sure that you can be a good. I usually aim for like at least 75% search top search impression share to know that if I have 10% to 20% of absolute top impression share, I'm number two. So you have to you have to massage those numbers essentially with manual CPC. Um, I would go the number I would focus on if you're just starting out is in the beginning have all of your keywords at least over 50% of top impression share. Ignore by budget by rank just right now, just go for 50% top impression share. Even if your absolute top impression share says less than 10%, that's okay. You're at probably in position number two through four. Start there so you're not overspending per click until you get the results to come in. Um, daily Google Ads News, finally. <laughs> uh, I, I am definitely gonna butcher this name, uh, Jean-Luc, did I get that right? If I hope if I do, I'm gonna pat myself on the back because I am terrible with names. I'm John. I have a simple name, one syllable, very very simple. <laughs> um, but yeah, hopefully, uh, hopefully you find the channel good. Um, Brian, do you see a big difference in conversions between desktop versus mobile user? You know what's interesting? 
is this is a self-fulfilling prophecy. <clears throat> so Ryan, what is your attribution model? That's the first thing that you need to know. Is it first click, data-driven, last click, linear, time decay? Depending upon what your attribution model is, I can flip those numbers instantaneously without ever getting a different result in sort of, in sort of my, my daily results, my, my cost per conversion and all the other stuff. What you'll notice is there's a human element to this that you need to interpret and then understand how your attribution model is attributing conversions appropriately. And what I mean by that is if you have a person pulling out their cell phone and they Google a keyword and then they find your website and they click on it and they say, huh, that's really cool. You know what? Um, they have a lot of this stuff here. Let me let me pull this up on my laptop. And they pull it up on their laptop and then they go back to the website and then they continue searching and then they buy something. Last click is going to say possibly that your mobile traffic is terrible and your desktop traffic has all the conversions. First click, depending on how they came back to your website and laptop, whether directly or organically, or maybe through a same Google search and click on the ad or maybe through your brand campaign is going to show that first click your desktop does terrible, but your mobile traffic does good. Uh, you do real estate. So searching properties. Okay. Um, what you need to know is what is your conversion actions attribution model? If your conversion actions attribution model is first click, you may see more mobile traffic do better. If it's last click, you may see more desktop traffic do better because when they convert, you're going to see what is the cost per conversion what's the conversion rate, all the good stuff, but your desktop traffic could possibly be just returning mobile users. You know, if they pull a laptop and they sit next to their, their loved one or their significant other, and they're looking at different properties, they may have found you though on the, on the phone. Now what happens is a lot of times what I'll see is people will prioritize the desktop traffic because it looks better. And so they'll actually just exclude their mobile traffic and their desktop traffic declines. It's because people are not finding them on mobile and pulling out the laptops anymore. So attribution model is very important. How are you attributing the performance data by device? Every attribution model is going to be perfect. It is, honestly. Every attribution model will work. It just simply takes the data and redistributes it differently, but the same amount of data. 100 conversions, as example, first click, maybe 80, des uh, 80 mobile, 20 desktop. Last click. 20 mobile, 80 desktop, you're still going to have 100 conversions. But knowing how you're allowing Google to attribute that to your devices is what's going to give you the feedback. Just understand that you need to know what that path is. Uh, Jean-Luc, oh, close enough. OK, I'm going to call you Jean-Luc then. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, or maybe it's Gianluca. Uh, I have a question. I'm advertising this terrible product for a whole work. <laughs> um, maybe that's the problem. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm advertising this terrible product for a home workout. Also very expensive, around 150. The client, the client expects conversions by having $30 a day uh, in search. It, it search the best way. Uh, I included a display with remarkable list, but not spending. What would your suggestion? I wouldn't run search. If you have a high price product like $150, my opinion, again, you probably everyone can hear can probably answer for me. Try smart shopping. The reason why I like that is because someone in smart shopping in smart shopping campaign, since it goes through all the six now, uh, six channels of Google, search, shopping, YouTube, GSP, display, and discovery. Smart shopping will place an ad in front of a large amount of people for a very small cost per click. And those people, before they click, have to say, hmm, this is a terrible product for $150, but I'm interested. And then they click, and then that's where you pay. So search is dangerous because you're going to pay the most amount of money because search is the most expensive network, especially if you get $30, the $30 daily budget. But search is going to say, I'm not going to show you what the product looks like. I'm not going to show you the price until you pay Google to come to a website and then see it. So smart shopping then allows you to take that, that weird element out and say, you know what? Someone has to see the product, the manufacturer, any sort of shipping information and the price in the picture of the product before I pay Google. And I'll pay Google 50 cents per click rather than $3 on smart shopping. So you have to understand that people are going to look at the product and say, hmm, this looks interesting. I kind of like that. And I agree with that price. Let me check this out. So smart shopping will deliver you four times the amount of users who already know how much it costs rather than click on your search ad, go to the website and say, that's horrible. And then leaving. So, and then smart shopping remarks the people that they think are interested. So definitely try smart shopping. Um, Ryan says, great point. Cool. Yep. That's good. Uh, what objective is best and 
you choose when you just start the search ads campaign and which bidding strategy you use as starting. I like to start with target CPA with a high CPA goal because our clients that work with us have to spend at least two grand per month. We don't take on clients that are less than that. So I spend two grand on experimenting with those keywords. So I, I would say what objective is best target CPA that I like. And then I use a tar high target CPA goal for the first week and it start to rapidly break it down as, as results start to come in as an example. Sometimes obviously you need to switch though. Maybe you need to go to maximize conversions. Maybe you need to go to maximize clicks, depending on if you have tracking issues, you might need to do eCPC in case you have like, you know, five exact match keywords that you know are going to perform or you highly suspect. So again, it's, it's never the same. I usually will give our SOPs, but half the time we change those SOPs. So, that's the problem is you have to be flexible and fluid in Google ads. You have to test everything because otherwise you're never going to know what's really going to work. Uh, I wish I had like a, the perfect one, but if I did, um, I'd probably be on a yacht somewhere because I'd be a millionaire because I know exactly how to make everything work. <laughs> uh, Rajat, how reliable is keyword planner forecast? 40%, 30 to 40%. Imagine all of those daily impressions and daily, daily clicks, so like the monthly searches, 10 X those. You'll notice in Google Keyword Planner, there'll be a keyword and then it says average monthly search is 10. And you're like, that is that is wrong. In the whole United States, they think that only 10 people per month are searching that keyword. No, they can't be right. You're right. It, it isn't. Whenever you see the 10 monthly searches, 10x those at least. There's at least 100 monthly searches. That's what I've seen on average all the time. Whatever you see in terms of volume, 10x those. And whatever you see in terms of top of range high cost per click, 2x that. <laughs> so it's just good rule of thumb. Uh, very, very conservative numbers in, in Keyword Planner. I don't know why. Uh, Bohan, John, would you just add that it costs $150 in the ad copy just to disqualify people that are not ready to spend $150? Um, no, because people, and, and here's one of the reasons, traf, and, and forgive me, what, we have a funny saying. It's called traffic is stupid. That's exactly true. Ad copy no longer really qualifies a user. They Google something, and then they click on the first thing they see because they don't care if they spend Google Ads money. Most people don't even know what Google Ads is. So I've tried price extensions. I've tried putting the price in the headline, even for ourselves. We're an expensive agency. I put it in the headline. People still ignore the headline, ignore the pricing extension, ignore the pricing page, and then come in and saying, hey, can I spend this much money? It's like you just miss literally everything, and then you fill out the form and do whatever you want to do anyway. Competitor traffic, we still get phone calls from people that think our clients are the competitors because they Google the competitor's name, completely ignore the website, completely ignored the, the phone, completely ignored the ad copy, went to the contact us page and said, hey, are you them? It's like, <laughs> so you can try. My opinion, you're not gonna see much difference. Um, that's that's what I would say. Now, I might be wrong. I'm just giving you my experience and we spend about a million dollars a month in Google Ads. It's usually doesn't work. So hopefully that helps. Um, ecom, ecom, hey, <laughs> I love the name. Uh, I already use smart shopping for a lot of campaigns. How do you optimize it? Also, have you heard that they will introduce negatives in smart shopping? What are your opinion? I've heard that. I've heard it actually for like a year. I also heard that they're going to give us search terms. I'm still waiting on that. I would love that. I would love nothing more than that. I would love to be able to introduce negatives and search terms. Literally everything in, sm in standard shopping, I want in smart shopping. They just don't give us that because it's omni-channel. So it's like, hey, this actually is keyword that we got was a DSK keyword, not an inbound search keyword because we showed it on G display. So hey, you know, that search term isn't really a search term. It was a targeting op opportunity. So I don't know if it's possible. I would love to do so. But how a few ways to optimize smart shopping campaigns is if you're and you're saying you're already using it, what I would do is if you already are throttling or, or using a ROAS goal, start lobbing off high spend products that have low performance for at least two months. Um, if you have, let's say, 20% of your product list and your SKUs delivering 80% of your sales, there's probably one or two at the top that are spending the most that don't have a good ROAS, like look at conversion value by cost. And if it's under, you know, like 0.9 or whatever your ROAS goal is, then just lob those off. Google will take an average and they'll spend a lot of money on the average. So here's what I mean by that. Your average, let's say your goal is 300% ROAS. You might have one product at 200%, one product at 400%, and they're spending crazy amounts. If you lob off the 200% one, it'll spend all that money in the 400 and then the next best thing. So what I usually see is Google will still spend a godly amount of money on products that are below ROAS goal because you have other products that are lifting the ROAS goal average. Lob those off if you can, if you have the room to grow. It's a good way to just really redistribute a lot of ad spend to products that may have a lot better result. Uh, Duraj, I meant to say which traffic objective uh, is best at starting a search campaign. I'm not sure what you mean by traffic objective. Um, uh, is that the goal? 
Uh, if it is, if you're looking for e-commerce, do sales. If you're looking for leads, do leads. Uh, hopefully that helps. Um, just know that depending upon the campaign you're choosing, you could be limiting your bidding strategy. As an example, you can't run YouTube shopping if you search, uh, if you use sales, a goal. You have to use without a goal guidance and then you're allowed to run YouTube shopping. So click into the goal and see if when you're building out your campaign, if that campaign bidding strategy is available to you. Depending on which goal you select, it may not, but it's also dependent upon which campaign type. So again, search, you can use you can use sales. I usually like to start almost everything without a goal guidance because then I can choose the bidding strategy. Uh, so hopefully that helps there. Scary society we live in when nobody pays attention, they just click. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, really. And and especially because people are probably driving their kids to school and they're searching. And so that's the other part too, is people are like watching TV or they're on social media and then they pull out their phone and they just start thumbing through things. Traffic is stupid is it will save you a lot of money. That saying, think about that saying, traffic is stupid will save you a lot of money. I have had ads. There was even an ad that showed a picture of a cat's face and it says, please, for the love of God, don't click on this ad. It's just a cat. Like it goes to no, no page, but just a cat. And they ran it and people just had like a 4% click through rate. Like it is ridiculous. So just know that you can save yourself a lot of money by purposely excluding the people that you, that you know, you don't want. So running a smart shopping campaign and running a search again, if you think about it, why does a smart shopping campaign have thousands of clicks, but only hundreds of sales? Because the other people still were just like, oh, that's kind of cool. That's, and then and then they leave. And then you paid a dollar for that. You're like, well, I didn't want to pay Google a dollar for you to find something that you thought was cool and didn't want to buy. So you really have to pre-qualify the traffic by only giving them the path to your website that has the most propensity to buy. Uh, how many keywords should have an ad group? I would say five to seven is a good, good, good average. Um, unless you're running pure broad, then maybe 10 total in the campaign. Um, I sell natural supplement with a team of 200 individuals who do the same because we are in the same min business. Um, but all, but all this, my team members have gotten their ass suspended and the business is downgrading. So how do we come out of the slums? I'm from Ghana. Another problem is our payment method here is always get suspended. I mean, if you use a debit card without violating anything, we still get suspended. We really need health things. Yeah. So health access, here's the issue. Google hates supplements. Almost every supplement campaign we've ever ran always runs the same issue. The only way we've definitively been able to fix this is by using a company called Legit Script. And I'll place that here. Uh, let me grab it for you because this might be something that you have to do. Um, we've had to do this a couple of times because we have like 7,000 SKUs and only like 200, only 200 got approved. And then the other, you know, 6,800 always disapproved. And then those kept suspending your campaigns. Google hates supplement companies with a passion. And so what you have to do is using legit script, legit script. I don't know who they know at Google, but if legit script says, Hey, we went through and you're not making any claims and you're not violating any policies and you're not, you know, talking about some things that are disapproved, they'll go through and clean up your whole list. And then they'll go to Google and give you the thumbs up and then bam, everything runs costs like four grand, I think. So it's expensive but it's a lot less expensive than running a thousand dollars in ad spend and then having it be suspended, disapproved, and then doing that four more times. So check out legit script. They will approve your compliance. Google will take that as, okay, good. Thank you very much. If legit script says you're good to go, then you're good to go. And then they white label you and then you can run. So health access, check them out, please. Uh, do you think competitors are clicking on your ad to drive a cost to clean your budget? Yes. And the Google will actually know that, find that, and then stop them. Um, you'll see something called invalid clicks and invalid click rate. When you look at the invalid clicks and the invalid click rate, that will show you how many times Google has caught people clicking on your ads. They refund you in real time by the hour. Sometimes you'll see that like if you know two or three clicks come from the same IP address and they bounce, that happens more than once. They're like, okay, then just ban that IP and then they'll refund you in real time. So Google has a whole wing dedicated to, to quality assurance and they, they work really, really hard. If you don't believe that that's doing enough, then check out, uh, ClickSees. ClickSees is pretty good with that. Uh, I run ads for a six figure a month supplement company and you have to have sales page clean as a whistle. Oh yeah. And <laughs> no claims, no prom, prom, uh, promises, a lot of disclaimers. Yep. It is a nightmare. It's like, okay, we believe that this could help support the influence of your immune system. Like it, if you just say like, Hey, so, you know, helps your immune system. Uh, uh, doesn't help. Can't prove it. It supports it maybe. So yeah, it is a nightmare, Bohan. You're absolutely right. <laughs> Um, 
What do you think about display campaigns using target CPA and paying for just conversions? I have super high clicks for first week and then maybe one sales and completely die. Yeah, it means that your your cost per conversion is too high or too, sorry, too low. Um, and it may not even be worthwhile running. We've run pay per conversion campaigns. We've, we've run those a lot and they're good. They're just good for lead generations. I don't think that Google has optimized that enough um, in order to for it to really be, what, what, what ends up happening is rather than pay per click, you just pay high amounts for a conversion. The way that we have those things running really, really well, lead magnets, white papers, lead generation that is low barrier to entry. And I'm like, hey, I'm only gonna pay $10 for that lead. <sighs> Sometimes those will scale them up and those are good. Uh, but a lot of times if it says, hey, we ran some traffic, we got a conversion, Google's like, well, I'm losing now a whole bunch of money on this because, um, you know, I'm giving them $20 conversions when it should have been $5 per click and they'll just atrophy. So you have to set your target cost per conversion really high, which is what you'll end up paying for those conversions. And then if you can't start that high and then reduce it down, once you keep reducing it down, you're going to find a level that your campaign impressions and clicks just drop off, raise it back up. That's the least that Google will allow you to pay for those conversions. Would you organize, and I got about one minute left, so it's gonna be the last one, everyone. Uh, would you organize an international, uh, I'll, I'll get back with you, John Lucas. So that's, that's your second part of your question, then we gotta be done. Uh, would you organize an international shopping campaign within one big campaign or separated by country, then optimize campaign wide? For, so what I usually do is I have one shopping campaign for every country, and then I break out the countries that do well. And then I stick them to the daily budget that the campaign was existing, uh, the existingly giving that country per day. So as an example, I'll use really round numbers. $100 a day, two countries, one spending 70, one spending 30. The one that's spending 30, doing fantastic. Take that 30, bring it out to its own campaign, give it a $40 per day to get that to start to scale. The other campaign will then get all of that uh, $100 per day and then monitor that very closely. So when you start to take a campaign and give it a daily budget and then you segment it, look at what is currently eating up in cost per day. And then when you break it out, don't go too much higher than that because otherwise you're just going to it's like taking a campaign and be like, I tripled the budget. Why did it fail? You know, it's just going to start shooting up high. So hopefully that helps. Would, target, would the display CPA paying for conversions be good to generate an audience? No. In my opinion, no, just because Google basically just shotgun blasts everyone because you're going to get like 10 cent clicks. Um, it's not the best for, for generating audiences, in my opinion. Again, for e-commerce specifically, smart shopping does a lot better. If you're looking to generate an audience on um, in search for lead generation, usually search. Search is what is going to give you that intent. And then your ad copy, your website copy, all of that can have that same very similar keyword intent. And that's usually what that audience is, is not necessarily who people are, or but what people are doing. I like to use Google as a not, are you a 27 year old male living in Texas? I just get, you can be a 91 year old female living in Texas as long as you're Googling the same thing that converts. So I'd like audiences based on in that intent and activity, not who they are. I could really care less who they are as long as they're buying and what are they doing when they buy? They Google this or they live here or wherever it is. Uh, yeah, daily news. Yep. Thank you so much, Mr. John, but please elaborate more on how I will use legit script. God bless you. Yep. So a legit script, you have to go into the area, um, into this here. Let me drop the link. Uh, here we go. This is uh, Health Access. Take this down. This is the Global Product Review. Confidently grow your supplement business in online marketplaces with, with legit script Global Product Review. This product review, you have to apply now for merchants. You go through, um, you go through compliance demonstrations. And uh, here's a, so here's a quick snippet. Global Product Review helps supplement merchants grow their business by helping e-commerce platforms reduce risk and increase revenue. Logiscript is trusted by the world's largest online marketplace, advertising platforms, and major credit card companies, including Amazon, Google, Bing, Facebook, and uh, Visa, and more. So go through them, have them clean and scrub your data, make any changes that you want, and then you're going to be approved. I got to be called that starting in two minutes. Anthony Davis, do this, please. Anthony Davis, I know you have three big questions. Um, Email me, john at sol8.com. Anthony Davis, please grab my email. Email it to me. I'll get back to you within like a day or two. I'm going to be slammed today, but I have to go in. Thank you so much, everybody. I love you all.